The lower limb is where we're going to find the largest and most powerful muscles of the body. So what kind of movement are we considering when we talk about the lower extremities? Three groups of movements that we can consider here, angular movement, rotational movements, and special movements. The first pair of angular movements is flexion and extension. Flex means to bend, so this bending is in the anterior posterior plane of the body, and flexion occurs when we decrease the angle between the articulating bones. So in this example that we see right here, the articulating bones are the femur of the thigh and then the tibia here of the lower leg. And we can see that the in an anatomical position, the angle between those bones is essentially 180 degrees. But when the knee is flexed, we can see that it brings the lower leg up at an angle that is then less than 180 degrees. And then flexion is going to be the exact opposite. Flexion of the hip occurs if you try to take your knee and touch it to your chest, um, while extension of it would be putting it back then into anatomical position. Abduction and adduction are two other types of angular movement. ABD, ab means to move away from the body's midline and adduction is moving it back towards the body's midline. So as you can see in this illustration here, moving from an anatomical position and taking that left leg and pulling it out in a lateral direction is going to be taking it away from the body. You're abducting it from the body. And then going and putting it back towards that anatomical position would be an example of adduction. Lateral and medial rotation are rotational movements. So some bones are able to actually rotate along their own longitudinal axis. And if these rotations occur in the limbs, then we describe them as occurring either away from the median plane or towards the median plane. So in this example here, we're gonna see a lateral rotation of the thigh. If we take the foot with that toe pointing forward and then take that left foot and rotate the toes away from the median plane, move them out in that lateral direction. And then medial rotation would be taking those toes and either and putting them back towards that median plane. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is one set of special movements that only occurs at the ankle. Dorsiflexion is when the superior surface of the foot moves towards the leg, and plantar flexion is when you point your toes inferiorly. And then finally, inversion and eversion, which occur in the intertarsal joints of the foot. During a move, an inversion movement, the sole of the foot turns medially, and eversion, sole of the foot turns laterally. So hopefully this is a little bit of a review for you of some of those actions that occur at the joints in the lower limb. What about the muscles that actually facilitate these movements? We are going to start with the hip. And the hip, if you recall, the coxal joint is a synovial ball and socket joint, so it is not only flexing and extending, it's abducting and adducting, and laterally rotating and medially rotating. We are going to start with the concepts of flexing the hip, as you can see here on the left, and extending the hip. So let's start with flexing the hip. Knowing what that movement entails and knowing that to create a movement, a muscle needs to contract and shorten, where on the leg, in general, are you most likely to find muscles that flex the hip? Are you going to find these muscles on the anterior part of the thigh, the lateral part of the thigh, or the posterior part of the thigh? I imagine that you've selected the anterior and that would indeed be correct. So we're gonna focus on that view as we're considering these muscles that flex the hip. So all of the muscles that flex from the hip originate on either the os coxa or the vertebral column, and then they insert into either the femur or some of them not only cross the hip joint, but cross the knee joint and then insert on the lower leg. We can see several of them here. We've got the psoas major and the iliacus. So the psoas major is originating from the vertebral column but then the um, iliacus is originating from the os coxa. Once the two of these muscles pass inferior to the inguinal ligament, officially the name changes and they become known collectively as the iliopsoas. We also have the tensor fasciolati that's going to be on the lateral side and inserting into that iliotibial tract. Coming from that same spine is also going to be our sartorius, which is going to kind of create this S shape across the leg. Then we have several of these medial muscles as well, the pectineus, the adductor longus, you can see a little peak of the adductor brevis. To get a good look at the adductor brevis, you really have to dissect the adductor longus and look below it. And then we also have the rectus femoris. The rectus femoris is one of the four quadriceps muscles. It is the only one of the four that acts on the hip joint. So keep in mind here, even as you're looking at this image, you should be able to notice that both the rectus femoris 
and the sartorius also cross the knee joint. So those are the two muscles out of this entire group that we know also act on another joint besides just the hip joint. So what about extension? Opposite action, opposite side of the thigh. Uh, first, the gluteus maximus. This is the single largest muscle of the body by volume. And we also have three of the four hamstring muscles, the semitendinosus, the biceps femoris long head, the semimembranosus. Notice that the biceps femoris short head, which is the fourth one of the hamstring muscles, does not contribute to this motion. Why? Look where it comes from. Its origin is from the linea aspera, so it doesn't even cross the hip joint. While all three of the other ones, the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and biceps femoris long head, all originate from that ischial tuberosity. And they all then insert at the proximal ends of either the tibia or the fibula. So that should be another clue going off in your head that, well, not only are those three highlighted muscles going to do something to the hip, but they are also going to do something to the knee because they cross that joint. And then we also have the adductor magnus. This is the third of the muscles with the prefix adductor that are working on the hip, only this one is extending the hip. And part of the reason that that occurs is because it has an origin that is much more posterior. The adductor magnus is a really interesting muscle because it has a very large insertion. Part of it inserts into that linea aspera of the femur, but then there's another portion of it, the most medial portion, that inserts into that adductor tubercle of the femur, and it creates the little gap there, the adductor hiatus, and that's going to become very important when we get to our discussion on blood vessels. So that's flexion and extension. What about abduction and adduction? We'll start with abduction. Just a few muscles that are responsible for this. If we look below the gluteus maximus, deep to the gluteus maximus, we're going to find the gluteus medius. And then here on this left image, we've cut the gluteus medius and we can see the gluteus minimus underneath that. Notice how these two muscles, the medius and the minimus, have fibers that are parallel to each other. So that should tell you that these two muscles are going to be very similar in terms of actions. This is another one of those good rules to follow. Look at the direction of the muscle fibers and that should give you a good idea about what this muscle does. Uh, what that muscle does, what the action is, especially if the fibers are moving in some kind of angular plane. Uh, the tensor fasciae lati is another example of, of one of the other ones, and I'm going to put this up on here now to note we've already talked about that one, so not only is it abducting, but we've already mentioned that it is also a flexor. So what about adduction? We've already mentioned several of these muscles. Actually, we've mentioned the majority of these muscles. Uh, the pectineus, the adductor longus, and the adductor brevis were all involved in flexion. And notice how they all have origins that are fairly anterior on the os cocci. While then we have the adductor magnus, which is the more posterior muscle, and so that was the one that was responsible for extension. We're adding to this group the gracilis. The gracilis was not involved in any flexion or extension of the hip, but it is going to assist with the adduction of the hip. I want to show you this quick little video here that's just an illustration of showing you all of those adductor muscles that we just talked about. So this is a, kind of an, an anatomical drawing of the skeleton that's showing you where the various origins and insertions are. So anytime you see a red spot on one of these bones, that implies that a muscle originates at that location. If you see a blue spot, that implies that that is a location of muscle insertion. I've dissected out these muscles, so on the right side of the body here, we can see the pectineus, and we can see the adductor magnus. And on the left side, I've left in the gracilis, the adductor longus, and the adductor brevis. So now you can get a really good view of what these muscles actually look like, because all of the pictures in your textbook have these muscles on top of each other, so I don't think you get a really good perspective. And so you can see that nice large size of the adductor magnus that we already mentioned. And then if we look at the longus and brevis, can you get an idea now about why these have that name? So look how long the adductor longus is relative to the adductor brevis. But the magnus, well, hey, that's the largest of all of them, hence the name in this case. Uh, and then here's the gracilis coming all the way down, and you can very clearly see where that one actually crosses the knee joint. Now, if you were, again, just initially looking at these, you might say, well, I can't really tell why these would be hip, or I could easily see why these would all be ab um, adductors, but why are some of these flexors and some of them extensors? Again, look at where those origins are. So that pectineus and then the adductor brevis and adductor longus, we can see have those more anterior insertions. While here's that adductor magnus, look where that is. It's much more posterior there.
So now we can get a good view of that. Here you can also see a really nice view of that um, adductor hiatus. So hopefully that helps you out a little bit with um, kind of getting a good picture of those in your head. On to rotation, laterally rotating and medially rotating. We're going to start with medial because that's the simplest of them. The tensor fasci lati is the only medial rotator that you are responsible for. And so this is now the third action of this. It flexes the hip, it adducts the hip, and it medially rotates the hip. This is the only muscle that does three things to the hip that you're responsible for. So flexion, adduction, and medially rotating. Laterally rotating, we have a lot more in this case. We have because we have to take into consideration all of these deep gluteal muscles. We've already mentioned the gluteus maximus, and we've already talked about the sartorius. And so all of those are going to assist with those lateral rotations. And especially with the sartorius, that should be pretty easy to see because think about how this originates on the lateral side of the leg, but it is inserting on the more medial side. So if this is going to rotate and you're going to pull this essentially closer to that, you can see how one of those motions is going to be that lateral rotation. But then if we look deep to the gluteus maximus, we can see here, right kind of in line with the gluteus medius and minimus, several other muscles that we just refer to as the lateral rotator group. We have the piriformis, the gemellus superior, the obturator internus, the gemellus inferior, and then the quadratus femoris. So those are our lateral rotators. Have we mentioned any of these before? Yes, we have. We already mentioned that the gluteus maximus is an extender of the hip, and we also mentioned that the sartorius is a flexor of the hip. But these other guys down here, these other lateral rotators, that's the only thing that they do. All right, so I wanna draw your attention to this figure from your textbook, table 12.10. This is a nice figure that summarizes all the muscle actions at the hip. Here you can see our muscles listed that are abductors, adductors, extenders, flexors, lateral rotators, and medial rotators. So why have I drawn red lines through some of these? If I've edited it in red in some way, that is because that does not match up with your lab manual. So for example, um, we, I pointed out how the adductor magnus really has two parts to it. The hamstring part of it, so the part of it that is inserting into that linea aspera, is the main part of it that is contributing to that extension of the hip. There is a small part of it that does slightly impact the flexion of it, but I'm not concerned about that for you in this course. As far as you're concerned, the adductor magnus is a hip extender and it's a hip adductor and the rest of these as well. So the main reason, again, I'm pointing this out is because I don't want you to see this table in your textbook and think that you need to memorize that. Make sure that you're going off of the actions that are in your lab manual. All right, so that's the hip. What about the knee? The tibiofemoral joint is a synovial hinge. And so our knee is able to both extend and flex, and that's it. So we've got some muscles that help to extend the knee and some that flex, and they're organized very conveniently for us. So all of those knee extenders are going to be as in part of, um, are going to be in the quadriceps group. So quadriceps for heads. All of these muscles have the same insertion. They have different there's variation in their origins. So we've already mentioned that rectus femoris as a hip flexor. What are the other quadriceps? We have the vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and there's also the vastus intermedius, which is deep to the rectus femoris. If we were to cut the rectus femoris right here and peel it back, we'd be able to see the vastus intermedius. So all of those insert into this quadriceps tendon and then this quadriceps tendon connects to the patella and ultimately then through the patellar ligament connects to the tibial tuberosity. So all of these are ultimately inserting into the tibia and hence their action on the knee. So if we have these anterior thigh muscles that are extending the knee, where should we look to see the muscles that are flexing it? We should be going to the posterior part. And these are the hamstring muscles. We've already talked about several of those. We've mentioned the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and biceps femoris long head because all three of those are hip extenders. We briefly pointed out the biceps femoris short head in that other image, but noted that it doesn't cross the hip because it's originating on that linea aspera. However, it does cross the knee, so all four of these, all four of those hamstrings are all flexors of the knee. And then two other ones that assist with flexion of the knee, two thin and long muscles. We have the sartorius, which we've previously mentioned, and also the gracilis. So the sartorius has two actions on the hip. It is going to flex the hip and it is going to laterally rotate the hip and it is also going to flex the knee.
the gracilis, what else did that do besides flexing the knee? Hopefully you recall that that was also an hip adductor. So all of these muscles that we're talking about here insert just distal to the knee, but we also have a set of muscles that originate just proximal to the knee and then insert much further down the leg. Uh, the gastrocnemius, that is the large muscle that's it, that you probably think of as your big calf muscle. If you were to sit there and kind of point your toes and tighten up those muscles in the back of your leg, this is the muscle that you're feeling. Um, gastro means belly. This is a muscle that has two different bellies to it. The plantaris is another very small muscle. It's right behind. The plantaris is, is very short, but it has a very long tendon associated with it. And then also underneath those, if I was to cut away that gastrocnemius and the other muscle that's below it, we'd be able to see the popliteus, which is another very small one. So we've got all three of those muscles here that are responsible for that flexion, in addition to the six that we talked about on the previous slide. So we've got nine total muscles that flex the knee, uh, but only four muscles that are responsible for the knee extension. So again, drawing some attention to some of the discrepancies between the textbook and your lab manual. So let's now move on to some of those special movements that are occurring farther down the leg. Plantar flexion. So plantar flexion of the foot that's kind of pointing the toes. So in order to be a plantar flexor, we're going to have to be focused more towards that posterior side of the leg. Go ahead and just sit there and point your toes and feel what muscles are tightening up there. You should feel that it's the muscles that are on the back of that calf. We've already mentioned the gastrocnemius and plantaris because of their actions on the knee, but I'd also like to introduce you now to the soleus. The soleus is this large fish-shaped muscle that's almost entirely below the gastrocnemius there. The gastrocnemius and the soleus come, um, have the same insertion on the calcaneus of the foot, and they insert via the calcaneal tendon, otherwise known as um, the Achilles tendon. So if you hear of people that tear their Achilles, this is the tendon that they're tearing. Look over here on the right and you can see another view of that tendon and can kind of see how isolated it is out here. So if you have a tear on that tendon, you're taking away some pretty large muscles there um, and are disrupting the function of some pretty large muscles in that posterior part of your leg. If we go ahead and dissect out those two muscles, so this right here that my pointer is on is the soleus that we've cut away, we can see three other muscles that are down below here. These are the tibialis posterior, and then the flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus. Tibialis posterior, okay, that name implies that we are going to be posterior to the tibia. And then the flexor digitorum longus. Not only does this muscle plantar flex the foot, it also flexes the digits, and specifically digits two through five of the foot. Flexor hallucis longus, remember that the hallux is the big toe, so this not only plantar flexes the foot, but it also flexes the hallux. In addition to assisting with plantar flexion, the tibialis posterior is also able to invert the foot. And then as I mentioned, the flexor digitorum longus and hallucis longus are also flexing the digits. If we head over here to this right image, we can see two other muscles that are lateral, primarily lateral muscles, but as we get closer to the ankle, they head a posterior to that lateral malleolus of the fibula. And then we can also see how they're going to be inserting more on the plantar side of the foot. So that implies that they are going to assist in plantar flexion as well. And those are the fibularis longus and the fibularis brevis. The name longus and brevis is implying that one of those muscles is longer than the other. And I know it's difficult to see exactly where the origin of that fibularis brevis is because it's underneath. So also try to remember that it's the fibularis longus that is the one on top. So especially as you're looking more distal on the leg and trying to identify these when you see one on top of the other, no, the longus is on top of the brevis. And these two muscles are also involved in everting the foot. So notice that if the muscle has the name tibialis in it, implying that it's associated with the tibia, it is an inverter. If it has fibularis associated with it, it is an everter. So what does inverting the foot do? Inverting the foot means taking that plantar surface of it and tipping it inward, tipping it toward the midline. What is the medial bone of the two? The tibia. Everting the foot, taking that plantar surface and tipping it outwards, tipping it laterally. What is the more lateral bone? The fibula. So that can hopefully help you remember which ones are inverting and which ones are everting. If it has tibialis in the name, it's an inverter. If it has fibularis in the name, it's an everter.
this is giving you another little view of this little trio back here in the posterior part because we're going to see another trio that's very similar in the anterior part. So this is that tibialis posterior and we can see how it's not only originating from the posterior side of the tibia but also from a bit of the fibula and the interosseous membrane between the two bones. And then we can see how it's coming on down and inserting into several tarsals, um, several tarsal bones and, and also metatarsals two through five, two through four, excuse me. And then that flexor digitorum longus is going to be completely um, originating from the tibia and then inserting into the distal phalanges of two through five. So it's going to be able to flex those digits. And the flexor hallucis longus is going to come around and uh, it's originating on that posterior distal fibula, but then going to insert into the distal phalanx of the hallux. Looking a little bit more of those insertions for the fibularis muscles, we can see that fibularis longus here coming on down around that lateral malleolus. And then it looks like here the tendon disappears, but it actually wraps all the way around and ultimately is going to insert into the base of metatarsal one and the medial cuneiform. So even though this is a lateral muscle, it's coming all the way around to that part of the foot. So think about how if this was where the insertion is and that muscle contracts, now can you see a little bit more easily how this would actually evert the foot because it's going to kind of wrap all the way around, kind of take your hand and almost wrap it around the bottom part of your foot and then pull your foot in that direction and you should see that how that eversion occurs. The brevis you can see here is much shorter again and it is going to come around and it's um, going to stop there at the base of metatarsal five. So those are the muscles that plantar flex the foot. What about the dorsiflexors? When we were talking about plantar flexion, we were focusing on the posterior part of the lower leg. Dorsiflexion, we're going to be focusing on the anterior part of the lower leg. And so we have the tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, and extensor hallucis longus. Those names probably look familiar because they closely resemble the trio that's on the posterior side, where we had the tibialis posterior, the flexor digitorum longus, and the flexor hallucis longus. So why are these called extensors if they're dorsiflexing the foot? Um, the extension part of their name is not referring to the dorsiflexion motion, but to the fact that they are extending the digits themselves. So the extensor digitorum longus and extensor hallucis longus are extending the digits. Uh, and then the tibialis anterior is also inverting the foot because remember our little rule that if it has a tibialis in the name, it's an inverter. You can't really see the extensor hallucis very well here because it's hiding behind the other two. So this gives you a slightly better view of that. So we can see again that tibialis anterior and how it has that insertion on the medial side to help facilitate the inversion. And then we can see our extensor digitorum longus and our extensor hallucis longus here as well. We can see a small little bit of the fibularis tertius. The fibularis tertius is one that does assist with that dorsiflexion and eversion as well. It's just very difficult to see and um, isn't well defined on any of our charts or models. All right, so one last time I'm bringing you to one of these tables from your book. Good news is everything that it's talking about here with the leg and the uh, with the actions on the foot, none of those are different than your lab manual. When it comes to the digits, the only actions of the digits that you're responsible for are those that are performed by the extensor digitorum longus and extensor hallucis longus, and then the flexion of the digits with the extensor digitorum longus and, ex excuse me, flexion and flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus. There are other muscles here that are responsible for moving the digits, but those are all uh, small muscles that we are not going to cover in this course. I do still want to draw your attention though to an image that is not visible on any of our charts or models, but that I think can really help you to, to integrate these concepts of where these muscles are located with where their actions are. So this is a cross section of the leg here, as you can see based on this little image up here in the uh, upper left side. So we've basically taken a knife through the thigh here, and this is the view as if this person had their foot sticking out of the screen at you. So the, as if the person's like the sole of their foot was pointed out at you. So this is the lateral side of the leg. This is the medial side of the leg. Here's the anterior and here's the posterior. So if we started, if you were to travel through the screen, you'd be heading up towards the hip. And I want you to take a minute or two and think about 
if you were to do this cross, cross section, what muscles would they be? Can you identify these muscles from this perspective instead of just this perspective like you've seen here on the right? And I'm betting you can probably figure it out. I'm gonna give you a little point to start by letting you know that the muscle I've tagged with the number one is the rectus femoris. So based on that, please go ahead and pause this video and really test yourself. See if you can identify all of those muscles from this perspective without looking at the textbook. All right, so I've already pointed out to you that number one is going to be the rectus femoris. So where do we go from there? Hopefully you've been able to identify that between one, two, three, and four, that's the whole quadriceps group that we're looking at. So if this is the rectus femoris, which one was just lateral to the rectus femoris? The vastus lateralis. What about which one was just deep to the rectus femoris? The vastus intermedius. And what was just medial? the vastus medialis. And then what was the muscle that was the most medial there that I was just kind of on top of and um, that vastus medialis, that would be the sartorius. So all of those muscles are going to be in this anterior component, this, this anterior compartment. This purple line is kind of representing this deep fascia that's keeping this whole group together. Let's move on now to this group of muscles that's outlined here in blue. These are all of those abductor muscles that we're going to find on the medial side of the leg. Six is quite large. Which one is that one? That is gonna be the adductor magnus. Seven and eight might be a little tricky and that's fine. And part of it is to think about, well, where is this cut actually taking place? Seven is gonna be the adductor brevis and eight is the adductor longus. And you might think about that because notice how at this point in the cut of the leg, the adductor brevis has already inserted into the femur and we'd have to travel a little bit further down, a little bit out of the screen towards the viewer before we're going to find the point where the adductor longus is going to insert. And then which muscle do we have that's kind of very medial there, but a little more posterior relative to this medial isolated muscle that we had before, that's gonna be the gracilis. And then last but not least, this whole green group back here in this posterior compartment of the leg, those are all of those hamstring muscles. So which one is which? The key is to look at the middle line here. So this middle line, you're always gonna find these two muscles that are a little bit more kind of squarish, a, a little um, not quite as thin as the two lateral muscles. And these are the two that form that line right down the middle. And so, and so if you can identify those two, that's gonna help you find the rest of them. Um, the biceps femoris short head is number 10. 11 is going to be that biceps femoris long head. And we know that right along that midline of the leg, the biceps femoris long head is in contact with the semitendinosus, and then the semimembranosus is going to be right behind there. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start with the easy ones. We're going to start with this lateral compartment here. Lateral compartment, I've changed, I've turned the leg a little bit so we can see here. We're looking at these two muscles right there, the most lateral ones. What is the lateral bone of the lower leg? It is going to be the fibula. Notice how these two muscles are right kind of in line with the fibula. They're just lateral to the fibula. Those are our two fibularis muscles. One of them you can see is, is uh, more superficial and the other one is deeper. Look over here to this picture again. Which one did we say was the more superficial one? That was the fibularis longus and the fibularis brevis was the deeper of the two. All right, so that takes care of that lateral compartment. Let's go ahead now and move to the posterior compartment. Uh, posterior compartment, I want to start with these, I want to initially just start with these, uh, these two muscles that are right here, and then we'll get to the ones that are closer to the bone because that, that gets a little more confusing there. Probably pretty easy for you here. You should have figured out that when we're looking at this one with the double belly, that's this muscle right here. That is going to be the gastrocnemius, and just deep to the gastrocnemius, just just deep to the gastrocnemius is going to be the soleus. All right, so that takes care of those, and now that leaves behind all of the tricky ones. So we have a trio in the anterior compartment, and we have a trio here in the posterior compartment that, if you recall, have very similar names but I will tell you this, they are not symmetrical between the two. And so this is gonna help you out a little bit, I think, in figuring out um, where these are. So when we're looking at this anterior chamber right here, remember that if when we were looking at the most superficial part of it, so right about here where my cursor is right now, 
um, that is looking at right about this region here. So do you see how when we're looking at this part here, there are two muscles that we can see at the superficial part of the leg there. And sure enough, we can't see muscle number three here. And remember that that was the extensor hallucis longus. That's the one that we can't see until its tendon peaks out right here and comes all the way out to the big toe. So the extensor hallucis longus is the one that's hiding underneath there, and that's the one that's right up against that inner osseous membrane. And also, if you recall, that is one whose origin was, one of its origins was the inner osseous membrane, as well as the anterior fibula. And you can even see that right here. So this one's in contact with the fibula. Notice how it's not touching the tibia whatsoever, okay? What is the only one of these three muscles that is touching the tibia? Number two, that has to be then the tibialis anterior. There's no reason one of these two would be named tibialis if it wasn't actually touching the tibia. So that should be also a little bit of a clue for it. And then the extensor digitorum longus is going to be the other superficial one that we can see um, right here. The other thing you can remember about the tibialis anterior is that anterior is that that's the one that's actually right up against the anterior border of the tibia. So then our back three that we have here, again, as I mentioned, and kind of give you a clue, they're not in the same order. And so that can sometimes be a little tricky. And as they get closer to the foot, as you hopefully picked up in the lab video, or will if you haven't watched the lab video yet, we have some crisscrossing of the tendons that's going on. So in this region here, we have the flexor hallucis longus, the tibialis posterior, and the flexor digitorum longus. So in this case, on the other side of the inner osseous membrane, that's where we're going to find the tibialis posterior. So the tibialis posterior is kind of the one that's hiding a little bit more behind there. It is still making contact with the tibia, however. And then our flexor digitorum longus is going to be here on the medial side, and our flexor hallucis longus is on the lateral side. This is very counterintuitive, which is why I'm putting it pointing it out to you now, because if you think about it, your big toe is on the medial side of your foot, but the muscle that is flexing it is on the more lateral side of the leg. And that's because, again, of this crisscrossing of the tendons that's going to go on here down by the ankle. So hopefully this will help you, and, and if anything, looking at this type of cross section will help you remember what some of these origins and insertions are because you can even see from this perspective um, you know the origin of the flexor hallucis longus is that posterior distal fibula you can very clearly see here how the flexor hallucis longus is connected and making contact with that posterior part of the fibula the flexor digitorum its only origin is the posterior tibia what is it touching here the posterior tibia you can actually see those a little bit easier see some of these origins of these um, this kind of these two trios here a little bit better even from this cross-sectional view. So go ahead and study. Make sure you learn what these are because later in this module as we start getting on to nerves and blood vessels, we are going to come back to these cross-sections and we're going to be looking at some of these blood vessels and nerves that you see here as well.